Hello, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday at 1 p.m. And you could also find me on the Conscious Resistance YouTube channel and Conscious Resistance uh, website. So today we have L. Dixon, who's a hippie anarchist rapper. Um, and he's also the creative director of uh, <laughs> Never Get Busted Company. Um, that uh, is a really awesome company that's helping to improve the lives of many victimless um, victims. <laughs> victimless crime. Uh, we say victims, right? <laughs> victims of the system. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so L. Dixon, so tell us a little bit about, let's, say, let's start off, how you became an anarchist. That's always a good place to start. <laughs> yeah, for sure, man. So um, I became an anarchist. Uh, well, there's kind of two levels to it, I guess. Uh, growing up, I never really believed in government, um, but it was more of like uh, just kind of the apathy of the youth. You know, it was one of those things where I, I feel like the youth today naturally has a distrust of the system, but we really don't have any like concrete um, like terms or uh, logic or or any sort of philosophical framework to put it in. So I felt that a lot when I was younger. And uh, it wasn't until I got in college and uh, after experimenting with psychedelics and wanting to be more in informed with how the world works and one actually wanted to make an impact and make the world a better place um, that I, I kind of had like a political awakening. And I started getting into politics and really wanting to be informed and not just um, assume that it was you know, that was bullshit without actually knowing what I'm talking about. So, um, yeah, I started uh, watching, you know, the primaries in the 2008 election. And uh, I, I really, uh, like a lot of people in this time period, I really resonated with a lot of things Ron Paul had to say. And, uh, you know, things about, um, you know, ending the Federal Reserve and dramatically cutting government programs and all that sort of stuff. But, um yeah, I saw how the media treated Ron Paul. You know, it, it it was it was completely obvious to me that he was that he really didn't have any chance because of the way the media outcasted him and the way you know, they wouldn't let him in a lot of the debates. Um, he was really treated as like this this extreme underdog with no support. When if you go to the internet, he had one of the biggest followings. He he generated more money online than any other candidate. And yet on the mainstream media, he was treated like, you know, this this old kook that didn't know what he was talking about. So I started to like it really it caused me to look into, OK, why is the media acting like this? You know, are they bought and paid for? Are, are they are they really as corrupt as I'd uh, assumed as a kid? And, uh, you know, it, it really forced me to, like, learn all about the system and uh, discover how corrupt it was. And uh, and. And what means it was corrupt and what were the, the tools and methods that the people in control used to, to keep the system the way it was. And uh, through that, I discovered, you know, uh, uh, just how deeply flawed the system is as a whole and that no one person was going to be the person to to change this entire corrupt system. But that it was a systemic error and that no, no, no group of individuals should be in control of everyone else's lives that that's an inherently flawed concept and so yeah yeah then i discovered the uh, non-aggression principle and voluntarism and that just gave that philosophical framework that i was missing as a, a younger adult it gave me that and it allowed me to like fully solidify my identity as an anarchist so so what books or um podcasters or you know personalities like that really solidified those concepts for you well I, again ron paul i read his book uh in the fed that was uh that was awesome um you know th there were a lot of people really I, I take a lot of influence from people like you know um timothy leary and terrence mckenna um as far as like you know the, the way out there characters that are really psychedelically influenced but then also some of you know the newer um uh, philosophers like you know stefan molyneux I, I really um i resonated a lot with what he says not that he he brought anything new to me he gave me concrete terms to put my intuitions in so i really appreciate stefan molyneux um yeah, yeah. I, I eventually began studying a little bit of Mises just because I started seeing his ling, uh, you know, his name around mm -hmm. uh, being tossed around the community. So there's a, a wide range of people, man. I, I definitely feel like 
Uh, myself for sure and you know most of our generation stands on the shoulders of giants you know that this, this day and age we have the internet we have the entire scope of human knowledge up to this point to tap into and you know it, it really empowers us to kind of pick up where they left off and take it a little bit further and advance the cause a little bit further than they could have we have the internet but you still got to go to college though right <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, man. I, <laughs> I trust me, I'm a dropout. I, my only regret about being a dropout is that I didn't do it sooner. I waited until my fourth year uh, right. before I realized that I was wasting my time. Um, <laughs> so, what, yeah. what, was, what was your major? Well, I, I bounced around, and that was part of the problem. Uh, I wanted to work in the video game industry at first, so I started off in computer science, and then uh, I shifted to business management because you know I really wanted to start my own business one day. But then I realized I hated finance and accounting, so I shifted to psychology because I was really interested in it. But it was like, hey, what the fuck do I do with psychology? So then I, I, they were just like, okay, you you've got to pick a major right now. You're wasting your time and ours. So um, yeah, at that point, I realized that I was just uh, I was working for this piece of paper that I really didn't need. Not not to say that I didn't take any valuable information from my college experience. There was some of that, but it was just this, this large amount of money that I was paying for this piece of paper when I, I really would have been better off if I just dove head first into my interest on the internet and using some of these new uh, educational platforms like the Khan Academy or you know, all the wide range of internet services there are where you can learn anything you could possibly dream of, any skill or any 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 other um, field of, of thought. Yeah, so. I firmly believe that the internet is um, going to render colleges and universities obsolete. And if, if they already haven't rendered public school obsolete, <laughs> you know. <laughs> all right. I think they have. You know, because. I, I, I really think they have. And and the only reason that it seems to me that people are sending their kids to public school, number one, is the law. Number two, it, inertia, right? Just because everyone else is sending their kid, you know, you have to send your kid, right? And it, it's just so funny how people, you know, complain to me because I have two kids, four-year-old and a two-year-old, and, and, you know, they're not going anywhere near those places. But people tell me all the time, you know, how can you do that? Don't you care about education? <laughs> don't you want them? Don't you want them to learn how to read or write? How are they going to learn their history? <laughs> don't you want your kids to have a future? Yeah. <laughs> don't you want your kids to do the same thing that our generation did? And I'm like, you know what? You're exactly right. My kids aren't going to learn anything because they're not going to this brick and mortar sterile environment where they're forced to sit down shut up and listen right memorize stuff regurgitate on a test <laughs> because exactly. mem memorization and indoctrination yeah that's that's what you call education today right <laughs> that yeah that, that makes sense <laughs> yeah that's the simplest way to explain the problem i see with the school system is they show kids what to think and not how to think that's why you come out with a, a whole generation of people that have the rote memorization skills and they're, they're very in tune with their propaganda. You know, they, they've memorized their propaganda head to toe. They can list all the presidents A to Z. They can list all the presidents, you know, from first president to last president. They can tell you exactly how things are supposed to be according to the textbooks, but they don't have the, the logic and, um, you know, the, the uh, reasoning skills to, to move forward beyond the or, what they've been indoctrinated with or to question at all you know or to question what they've yeah. been what they've been taught you know the i think george carlin said you know more more than teaching kids how to think <laughs> you have to teach kids how to question right what they've been taught because right. um once you once you blindly accept things because other people have told you or because authority has told you then you're committing a, an enormous fallacy of logic right logical fallacy of appeal to authority um, but, uh, but yeah, <laughs> I talk to people, you know, you know, I tell them, you know, kids are forced to be in, in public school for 12 years, right? Now imagine if you were to devote 12 years of your life to doing anything, right? How much of a master would you be at that or at multiple disciplines, right? Whereas with kids right. like, after 12 years, they're only, they're barely eligible for a minimum wage job, right? Barely, they barely have the skills for that. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, that's all they it's do. crazy, man. We laugh, but it's, it's sad the, the way they do it, man. It's, it's crazy. Like, I, I don't, I don't know. One of the things that really irks me about the situation too, is the fact that, um, you know, despite, 
the school system being really focused on um, science and, you know, the, the scientific method and uh, giving kids a full understanding of scientific history and everything, right? We, we don't approach our school system with the same scientific method. Like, if you look at a, at a lot of the studies that are coming out about how, the best conditions for, for children to learn under or, you know, under what means people will thrive the most and, and, and learn the most and be best prepared for the world, it it all this new scientific evidence that studies are showing is completely contrary to how our system is set up. Like yeah. it, it just doesn't make sense at all. Waking kids up early in the morning and bringing them in to work factory hours and just uh, teaching them exactly what you want them to learn and not what they're passionate about. The, the science is showing now that uh, that just doesn't work. But the school system doesn't respond to that. We don't we don't know how to they, they can't practice what they preach in the simplest mm-hmm. terms. Like they can't apply that same scientific method to actually making their their function better on, on this planet. It's, yeah. it's pretty, pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a broken window fallacy. That's, that's why I tell people because they, they always say, look at you. You went to public school and you turned out okay, right? <laughs> <That's a> classic, <laughs> yeah. classic broken window fallacy or, you know, not recognizing the seen versus the unseen. Right, all they see is me and how I am today. Right, but you don't see what was destroyed, the potential that was annihilated through being forced into an institution against your will and learning things against your will. Right, <laughs> so right, right. It's uh, it's interesting. So tell me a little bit about your uh, your rapping, rapping uh, history, and what you're into with it. Oh yeah, man, uh, I, I've been rapping for as long as I can remember as a kid I was making up songs and you know they were completely stupid but it was fun I just loved it <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it's something that I've done for a long time um, and it's, it's kind of hit several phases you know I did it as a kid just playing around thought it was fun um, around the time I was uh, 14 or 15 um, I got really inspired like you know listening to Eminem and, and his mastery of words and rhyme and I, it just really inspired me to, to take it more seriously like, hey, this is something I really think I want to do for the rest of my life. I just enjoyed it. It's like a, a puzzle that, that my mind just geeks out on. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I started doing it as a teenager a lot more seriously, like writing on a daily basis and everything. But uh, even then, I didn't really expect to do anything with it as far as like, you know, a career or expected that I was going to like actually trying to make anything of it. I always wa- wanted to work in the video game industry, go to college, be a programmer, this and that. Um, but yeah, it wasn't until <laughs> I got I, halfway I, I, through I, I, college. Let, let, let me just interview, interrupt you one, one minute yeah, yeah. because you just reminded me of something. You said you didn't do it. You, you weren't doing it as you weren't thinking about it as a career. Right. And, right. I, and I was just thinking that I think that's one of the, one of the things that destroys child children's like, um, you know, creativity and imagination is, is you have to say, okay, put the stuff that you like to do aside and now think, what exactly. do you want to do for the rest of your life? <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, and that's crazy. What, what, what better way to destroy a kid's desire for, for you know, following up and pursuing something than <laughs> like, oh, man. I know. I got to decide some, one thing, just one thing to do for the rest of my life. <laughs> just one thing. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't feed my kids that I'm going to have in 15 <laughs> or 20 years, then it's not worth it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> That, that's what they make you think. That's yeah, what they make yeah. you think. Yeah, sorry. So as this this fourteen or fifteen year old kid, that, that's exactly what's running through my mind. Like, <laughs> hey, I I love this. This is really fun. But um, can I feed the kids that I'm gonna have in fifteen years with it? Yeah. Mm, maybe, maybe not. It's kind of a long shot. Maybe I should just go the safe route. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> the safe route. The safe route. So um. Yeah. Anyway, again, middle uh, towards the middle of my college experience, um, I started to really realize that. Wait a second. This whole thing is a con game. I should just be doing what I'm passionate about. Now, don't get me wrong. I was passionate about the video game industry and going in that direction and everything, too. But I started to realize that the way I could best impact the world as I'm going in through this awakening, awakening process and realizing that, oh, this is fucked up and that's fucked up. This whole system is corrupt. I'm like, you know what? This music is a really powerful tool to be able to communicate something to people that they naturally wouldn't necessarily listen to, you know? Because, I mean, there are a lot of people that'll, that will sit here and listen to a, uh, an hour of philosophical, um, you know, conversation about the non-aggression principle and, and voluntarism. But there, there's a, 
a, a wide range of people that would never hear that out. But if I can slip that message into a rap song that sounds like something on the radio, right? Everybody will listen to it. And regardless of whether they understand at the time, it'll permeate and, and into their mind, you know, and eventually people will start to get it and it'll make it mainstream and it'll make it cool, you know. It, the, 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 at the point where we have volunteerism and anarchy being like the, the cool things to do and even people that might not necessarily like fully grasp the, the uh, philosophical ramifications of it that's the point where we're really going to start to have some success and like break through into the mainstream. And I think it's coming. I think music is an awesome tool to do that. So once I realized that, uh, I really committed myself to, hey, I'm going to make this happen. However long it takes, whatever I have to do, however hard I have to work, I'm going to make it happen. Cool. Yeah, that kind of reminds me of uh, uh, Larkin Rose. Uh, he recently said that um, sometimes some people – you know, like you said, enjoy listening to long philosophical discussions and explanations and theories and all that kind of stuff. And that's good for a certain segment of the population. But other people who don't necessarily <laughs> want to think so profoundly, <laughs> right? So these people are more, you know, reactionary. And, uh, and so if you were to just, you know, drop, you know, the phrase like just say government is Ill illegitimate. Just say that and walk away <laughs> to some people, you know, <laughs> that will plant a seed and they're going to be like, wait a minute, what, why, how, <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and then maybe they hear it again because actually his point was that some people, in order to be convinced of something, all they have to do is hear many people say it, right? So yeah. this is the, um, I believe this is the hundredth, hundredth monkey effect, right? Where they did a study like a hundred monkeys learn something and then eventually the whole population of the monkeys know it because, you know, it, it's like spread so quickly. You know, so just a small portion of the population, you know, a really passionate portion of the population have to a advance a certain philosophy. And then once, once that gets started, then the rest, everybody else will just conform because most people don't really want to think about <laughs> philosophy on a daily basis, you know? <laughs> so, so, yeah, yeah that, that's how I see rap also, is that you can, you can just drop these, um, you know, these concepts, non-aggression and property rights and different, in different ways you say it, you know, government is illegitimate, government is immoral, violent, monopoly and all that. And, uh, and it's just something that they can think about, right? That, yeah is that yeah that, yeah that's that, 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 that sums it up man yeah that's exactly how i view it and uh yeah i i really think it's gonna take it's gonna get a lot of traction i think because it's i feel like this is something that most people want to believe anyway you know like i, I feel like deep down most people they, they don't they don't they know they don't want to be controlled right but they have so much of the the propaganda weighing down on them, and they, they they've been told all their life this is how it's supposed to be, and so they just kind of conform to that, right? And they have this these walls that have been built around them by society that prevents this sort of information to get in, you know. But I feel like most people, once it does get in, and once they realize, like, if they can actually, like, you know, g grasp. The, the logic of why this is wrong, they, they're just going to come out and they're going to feel so, they're going to feel like a weight lifted off their shoulders because it's like, that now, now I know this is illegitimate. This entire system that we're suffering through that most of us are miserable in, like, you know, being under this control and being told how we're supposed to live and driving, or driving your car and constantly looking over your shoulder and being nervous every time you see red and blue lights flashing. All this, it actually is bullshit. And, and now I can say that and feel confident with it because, you know. Now, now, like you said, a lot of people only need uh, a lot of, you know, to hear a bunch of other people say something that's true before they can accept it. So if enough of us can say it's true, then they'll feel comfortable in accepting the fact that, hey, this, this is real. This is true. And it's OK for me to, to believe this now. It's OK for me to, for me to even admit it in public, because, I mean, much, much like the homosexuality movement or or much with like like with drug users i feel like there's a lot of people out there that actually feel in the same way that a lot of anarchists feel and that they they really deep down have anarchistic beliefs but they're they're afraid they're just afraid to step out of that that box mm -hmm. because they just you know they might not know how to defend it if anybody you know um you know actually digs into them about it or um whatever the case may be they might not want to stand out 
Um, again, for the same reasons that the homosexual movement has a lot of people in the closet or that the drug movement has a lot of people in the closet, I feel like anarchy has the same thing. Yeah, so. yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think a lot of people, you know, who who support government, they don't really, they don't realize how much anarchy actually dominates their life already. <laughs> you know, like, you know, <laughs> what time you want to wake up? What do you want to eat today? Where do you want to go today? You know, that's anarchy. That's making your own choices, right? <laughs> that's being an individual, yeah. right? You know, yeah. uh, if you really want government in your life, then, you know, <laughs> you know, they say those memes, you know, if you, if you really love the government, move to North Korea, move to Cuba, <laughs> you know, or, exactly. or move, you know, move to communist China, <laughs> because that's the epitome of uh, statism, right, is uh, communism or totalitarianism. So, um, yeah, people have to realize that, you know, anarchy is really what dominates our life, you know. And, you know, we, most of the time we really don't have uh, involvement with government agents, you know, unless you get stopped by a police or, you know, you go to DMV or whatever, right. Um, but, but actually, you know, one interesting thing reminded me of when, when you said about the police, like, you know, everybody says, you know, but the police keep us <laughs> safe, right? They law and order and they, and they keep everybody, you know, safe and in line. And I'm like, all right, so when you see – you know, the lights flashing in your rear view mirror. Do you feel safe? <laughs> you feel safe? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, right? Do you feel safe when you see those? No, you feel fear. Be honest. You feel fear when you see those lights. No, ask yourself why you feel fear. <laughs> why do you feel fear when you see the lights? Sorry. You know, they're not, they're not here to serve and protect. <laughs> you know, for, for, for most of us, our parents served and protect us as kids, right? So when you see your parents, how do you feel? Like, like, oh, mom, yeah, right. oh, dad. <laughs> exactly. you, know, you feel good. It makes you feel good because you know those people are really there to serve and protect you. How do you feel when you see a police? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not the same. <laughs> it's not the same thing. You see, I, I feel like we can communicate uh, these sort of ideas in the most basic terms. Mm-hmm. Just like that. That's, that's very basic. Like, how do you feel when you see, do you, do you actually believe the po- police are here to serve and protect you? Yeah. Okay, well, how do you feel when you see the police? Yeah. <laughs> Do you feel served or protected a- after your dealings with the police? Mm-hmm. And I mean, and it's crazy. It's it's a crazy idea to even begin with that the police are are gonna serve and protect us, right? Because I mean, when you consider the the context under which most crimes happen, the police simply can't protect you in in, in those situations. You know, yep. like. Uh, the vast majority of crimes that occur, especially violent crimes, are, occur you know out of nowhere. The cops are nowhere to be found. They're there to respond to the crime, granted, but they they're not. They can't. They can't protect you. They they, they just can't. You, only we and our community can can protect protect ourselves. You know. Yeah, and actually, I've been I've been hearing a lot about um, you know recent court cases how saying that the police don't even have a duty to protect the people or their property, right? And most of the time, when police see a violent situation, you know, uh, you know, a theft or or um, you know some kind of holdup maybe or or whatever, they don't usually go in and risk their lives. Usually, they stay on the outside and wait until <laughs> the threat has been resolved. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's quite sad. Like, the propaganda that you see in the movies, you know, the heroic police, you know, risking their lives for saving, you know, little old ladies and everything. It's, it's what it is. It's propaganda. You know, most of the time, police, they, they have no obligation to protect you. And, you know, if you get hurt or you die, they don't get they barely any repercussions, right? So there's just no, um, no incentive for them to do anything. To protect the citizenry, yeah. right? And and incentive that is the crucial word. I feel like for everything, right? It's like any good video game designer will tell you that you get what you incentivize. Mm-hmm. So we we have to consider uh, consider in our our society what is being incentivized. Uh, I mean, you have things like uh, civil forfeiture, right? Where where you know this is something we deal with on a regular basis and never get busted. Where um, if the cops uh, bust somebody, say for a drug case, for example, right? They have the right to go in and just take your property. They can take your property and, and they basically, they, it's their property. It becomes their property. They get to make money. They get to auction it, make money off of it. They can seize uh, all your, you can seize your savings and stuff like that. And they have this huge profit incentive to go out of their way. And, and even like, you know, cases that, that aren't, really a threat to anybody like you know we're talking about nonviolent drug offenses 
they have a huge incentive to even be corrupt with it and and to distort evidence and to to break procedure because they really want to get that Bentley and they really want to get that five hundred thousand dollars that this guy has in his safe. <laughs> so it's like we, we're we're giving these behaviors that we incentivize, you know. Oh, yeah. I mean. About politicians, they're they're incentivized to to what? They're incentivized to conform and pander to the mainstream in order to get their votes because they really want to protect their own position, right? So I mean, uh, in no way are politicians incentivized to actually do what's beneficial for the people. They're just incentivized to serve their their corporate masters and and to serve the same needs that that pay their that um, you know that donate to them and that give them their their million dollar donations and you know that whole it's just it's incentives whatever you incentivize that is the behavior you're gonna get you know I, I firmly believe that um, you you know how I don't know if you read about um, Plato's The Republic you know he talks about philosopher kings you know how how kings you know kings should be philosophers and philosophers should be kings but I really even think that even if kings or presidents are philosophers they're still going to do harm because how can one person or even a small group of people make decisions that's going to benefit millions of people, right? That's completely impossible. <laughs> millions of unique, diverse individuals, you know, with different wants, needs, and desires. How can you possibly cater to all of them? You can't, you know. And <laughs> yeah. You're always going to be hurting people regardless if your intentions are good or bad, right? So, and again, you know, right. the, you know the the, the the was it the road to hell paved with good intentions, right? <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. it always is. So 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 you mentioned yeah. um you mentioned never get busted. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? So yeah, um, never get busted is basically uh. You know, again, it began as, uh, you know, this initiative um, started by Barry Cooper, who was a semi-famous, like, uh, narcotic officer in Texas. He was one of the top-rated officers. Uh, He he was, uh, like, you know, statewide renowned for his abilities and, you know, being on that end of the drug war. Uh, and you know, busting people and um, and leading raids and and uh, you know that whole nine. He basically realized that everything he was doing was wrong. He realized that he was ruining families and ruining lives over marijuana and other harmless drug offenses. And uh, so basically, he wanted to reconcile for everything that he had done by teaching people how to not get busted, how to not be a victim of the same inhumanities that he you know that he suffered upon people and uh so he made the first two dvds never get busted volume one and never get busted volume two which showed people how to not get busted when cultivating and transporting drugs and uh you know they've sold millions of copies worldwide and uh, a lot of people have uh taken a lot of uh, inspiration and have, have protected themselves um based on the information provided and those DVDs, and it really grew and blossomed into a, you know, more of a humanitarian effort where uh, we use Barry's uh, expertise as an expert witness and a lot of his knowledge from being a former uh, narcotic officer to um, to sort of like shatter a lot of the um, a, lot, a lot of the bullshit that people are suffering through in these these court cases, you know, whether it be um, you know a, a, an abuse of power or you know a, a, an officer breaking procedure and not doing things how they're supposed to be done, um, you know, th- there's a whole range of things that he's able to cut through uh, based on his uh, status as a, a top-ranking former. A narcotics officer and uh yeah we've been able to free hundreds of people from either you know um court cases and probation or even from prison um from federal prison even uh, we had a guy mr wilson uh who was actually uh, he was in prison for 30 years he was uh he was sentenced to for marijuana seeds he <laughs> all he had was marijuana seeds and he was sentenced to 30 years the seeds we're talking about the seeds of a plant he could have just told him he's gonna <laughs> use them he's, he's gonna use them for cooking right like human seeds coriander <laughs> seeds right <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Wow. You know, you're just gonna put them in a grinder and, and yeah. use them for a season. For a smoothie. Um, but yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, smoothie. 
Yeah, man, it, it's crazy. Um, but yeah, we were able to get him out. He had already um, suffered 15 years wow. in a uh, federal prison, but we were able to get him out 15 years early uh, based on our reporting and uh, my Barry's expertise. Wow. So uh, yeah, not, never get busted is a, a cause that I'm happy to be aligned with. And uh, yeah, that I feel like a lot of people can benefit from, especially in this this day and age when uh, America has uh, how many more times of of prisoners than the the nearest uh, other country. You know, we we have by far the most prisoners, like multiples more than the, the again the second place country. I don't even know who's second place at the moment, but it's insane, man. It's yeah, insane. Yeah, it's it, dark I think, ages. I think it's higher than like um, we have the highest percentage of uh, of our population and per capita, you know, in our population even more than China, right? Which <laughs> has around yeah, over yeah. a million people, right? Which is yeah. which is really amazing. With yeah. I mean, China just came out of communism too, so we're even <laughs> more fascistic than China, which is pretty amazing. You know, people are like you know, America's freedom, <laughs> you know, freedom. <laughs> Freedom, America. I'm like, okay, what, what, what freedom? You know, the, the, the terrorists hate us for our freedoms. So I'm like, what? What, what freedom? <laughs> Where's the freedom? You know? That, that one always cracked me up because, okay, <laughs> it, even insofar as we assume that that's true, right? Yeah. How do we respond to that? If, if you know, 9-11 happened because the terrorists hate us because we're free, and then we immediately turn around and, you know, we, we issue the Patriot Act, we're stripping our freedoms away. Okay. Like, have they not won? Mm-hmm. The terrorists hate us for our freedom, so we should be less free. Yeah. <laughs> America yeah. logic. Yeah, and like America we, logic. I think they, they, um, how many? Thir- what, Three thousand people died, right? Nine eleven, and then since, uh, you know, since we started the, um, the wars in the Middle East, I think about a million people have died, more, more or less. And so it's like it seems to me it's like somebody, you know, somebody, um, like you kill, let's say, I don't know, one person, and then they kill. You, your family, your extended family, your entire block, maybe, you know, you know that's like, that's like our <laughs> yeah. idea of, uh, of retaliation is like just exterminate the entire Middle East. You know, that should solve the problem. It's just, let's just, le- let's just <laughs> level crazy. it to the ground. <laughs> that's all we have to do. Oh, they're killing people. So uh, we should go in and just kill all of them, you know, <laughs> and collateral damage and all. Like, doesn't matter who's nearby. Let's just kill all of them. Oh yeah, because they're killing people. Yeah, might might equals right. It's uh, that's the logical fallacy of the the force, right? Appeal to 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 the force or the appeal to the stick. Yeah, yeah man, <laughs> that's one of the bases I really try to reach people, and uh, you know, it, it it's disheartening sometimes, like how how often it doesn't really resonate with people. But the fact that you know we have this moral inconsistency from the individual to the collective, you know, like it's completely okay. For the state to, to send individuals to go over and, and murder somebody else for, for territory or in retaliation or whatever. But we understand in the, in, you know, within our country that if you murder someone else out of retaliation, then it's still wrong, right? You still go to jail. They, they don't care. The, the reasons that the state goes to war are the same reasons that gangs go to war. It's the exact same reason. But, but if a gang does it, then, you know, we lock them up in prison. And if the state does it, then we cheer them on and we give them badges and we, we express our, our nationalism about how proud we are of our veterans. And it, it's, it's completely it's schizophrenic. We live in a schizophrenic era. Yeah. Really. Yeah. You can kill, you know, kill as many people that you never heard of, you know, might have been friends with, and you get the Medal of Honor, right? You get the Medal of Valor, you get the Purple Heart, or whatever <laughs> crap they give, uh, for, star. you know, for spilling, <laughs> for spilling innocent blood. Um, you know, it's, uh, and, and then, you know, you know, like the, like talking about the Chris Collin movie, I don't know if you saw that, the American Sniper, did you see that movie? I, I, I haven't. I didn't, yeah, me neither, but I refuse to see it, but I've learned so much just from other people talking about it, I can kind of get an idea of it already. Um, and it's like, it's like, you know, he's like, um, considered to be a hero because he killed like 160 people over there. Right. But, you know, and, and then, and then, um, I was watching a video, Adam Kokesh was interviewing some people about, about the movie and they were saying, you know, he's, he's an American hero. We should support the troops, you know? <laughs> and they're like, he, he, he was killing terrorists. These are evil people. And then Adam Kokesh was basically saying like, <laughs> if, if a foreign invader came to this country and occupied our land, you know, and with rolling tanks through the streets, would you not feel compelled to resist or try to get them out or kill them? 
<laughs> like, and you know, and is that justified? Of course, it's justified. They're just defending their land <laughs> against foreign invaders. You know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's what we call, you know, insurgents, right, or terrorists. It's just people defending their land, and and then you, you know, you kill, you kill one person. And of course, you know, maybe ten you creating ten more people who are really angry and hate the U.S. and you know join some kind of f- right. fundamentalist movement and want to you know cause more violence. So it's, it doesn't solve anything, you know. Exactly, people that may have not even heard of any of these movements, the you know ISIS and Al Qaeda and all these other boogeymen, you know, people that might not have even heard of those movements before. Uh, you know, now you're you're bombing their neighborhoods and you're killing their family members. How do you think that's going to make them feel about the U.S.? You know, how, how do you think that's going to make them feel about these boogeymen that they, they didn't know, didn't have anything to do with? But I mean, na- now it's like now it's about protecting your, your family. Now it's about protecting your home when, when it when it comes down to, you know, the defending yourself and your your neighborhoods and your your people are being bombed, you know, like. Yeah. Oh, it's insane. It's insane, <laughs> yeah, that, man. And that's what they call defending the country, right? Defending our freedom is going over an ocean and killing people that you never met, right? That's called defending <laughs> freedom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right? That's not, yeah. that's not offensive. That's defensive, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's the, uh, what do you call it, the, the, the newspeak in, uh, you know, 1984 George Orwell, right? So the, the, the Department of Defense is really the Department of Offense, right? Public education is really yeah. the, you know, the Department of Education is really the Department of Indoctrination, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> things like yeah, that. Man. You know, counter, uh, you know, the, the uh, currency creation or quantitative easing is really just counterfeiting, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically. Basically, that's all it really is. I mean, they, they have a monopoly on counterfeiting. That's all, that's, that's all the Federal Reserve is, an organization with a monopoly on counterfeiting. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so let me ask you, when you talk to people about um, you know, anarchy and volunteerism, how do you, how do you like, get started with the conversation? You know, how do you, how do you, what, what's, what's usually your alliance to, to get people to start thinking like when you meet people on the street or something? You know, uh, a lot of times it's um, it depends on who I'm talking to and and how I have to approach that person. Uh, you know, whether they're a really logical person or or whether they're a really emotional person or what biases I already know they have. You know, maybe they're in a specific field when I can show them how the state is is completely thwarting the um, innovation in their field. It's a lot of different scenarios, but one of my favorite things to approach people with is, uh, okay, okay, if you believe in government, right? Do you believe that the elected officials are your moral, intellectual, or spiritual superiors? Do you believe that these people are your moral, intellectual, or spiritual superiors, right? And if the answer is no, then why do they have any, why do they have any right to tell you how to live your life? Because most people won't admit that. Oh, yeah, I think these people are way smarter than I am. They're they're more moral people than I am, and they're people that are more spiritually adept. That's why I listen to them. Most, most people will never say that. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, if in insofar as you accept that you don't believe that these people are morally, spiritually, or intellectually superior to you, then there's no reason why they should tell you how to live your life. Right? And, 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 and then they say, but we're government. We elected them, right? They're representing us, right? So <laughs> we give them the power. They're our servants. <laughs> so what would you, what would you say? That? Oh, oh, yeah, the, the, the people that are our servants, right? I mean, we elect them, quote, unquote. We, we quote, unquote, elect the people that have the most um, you know, financial backing. And then once they're elected, they, they don't have any... They don't have any uh, obligation to listen to what we have to say, nope. right? Because mm-hmm. I mean, if if it was actually about what the people believe, and you know whether the people want, um, you know, marijuana legalization, right? We would just we would just listen to the people. Mm-hmm. We we would just listen to the people. Uh, how many scenarios have there been where the majority of the people want marijuana legalization, for example, and yet their elected officials don't want to vote for that? So no, you don't get it. You don't get it. <laughs> you get what the elected officials want. Yeah. You know, I, want. I, I was just thinking about this, that, uh, you know, some people tell me, you know, you, you should support marijuana legalization because, you know, that's baby steps towards anarchy, right? You know, we can't, if we just want anarchy outright, you know, 
you're 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 not going to be satisfied. So we have to make baby steps. So you know, the, the legalization of cannabis is a baby step. But to me, that seems like it seems like you know, slaves just you know, slaves you know in the South chain slavery, wanting just a you know a slightly longer chain. Or just give us a recess, master. Just <laughs> yeah. give us recess. <laughs> you know, just like, uh, uh, you know, or just whip me a little bit less, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically what it is. So yeah, It really is. Like, maybe just punch us and don't hit us with the whip. Maybe yeah. we'll take that. That's a big win. That's yeah. freedom right <laughs> That's there, you know. <laughs> we only get punched. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, so, so you know, of course we, we, we support these things, but it's just a wasted effort to just, you know, you know, petition your politician or, you know, um, write letters or, you know, m- you know, make banners, you know, s- you know, support legalization of cannabis. <laughs> like, of course, you know, that's that's one small aspect of freedom. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely, man. I, I mean, and th- that's why I don't feel like, uh, you know, a lot of people, a lot of libertarians, they, they have this whole ideology where we're supposed to. You know, we're supposed to get in government. We want to get libertarians in government so we can gradually start to, like, you know, repeal laws and we can have the libertarian influence on government. And, like, you know, we can get enough people to vote and, you know, we'll vote some some new provisions in or we'll repeal some old law. No, 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 no. We can't we can't work within their system like that. That's it's never going to work. It's going to even if it was going to work, it would take way too long. Like yeah, humanity could destroy themselves before we can ever get enough libertarians into office to Im- impact things on a national level. I, I don't think that's going to be the case at all. What I think is going to happen is there's going to be like a um, a gradual disintegration of government as technology begins to uh, to overpower everything that government represents. Right. So I, one of my favorite metaphors to use is because it's, it's easy to see and it's already happened and most people resonate with it is um you think about all the the laws against illegally downloading music right yeah. like napster came out and the riaa and all these government institutions were like oh no you can't download music this is illegal you're violating copyrights and and they wanted to like take all these people to court for downloading music and lock people up and fine people and uh yeah, they, they really tried to use the power of the state to, to suppress this technology and su- to suppress this new freedom that this technology was enabling. And we all know how that turned out. I mean, Napster was easy to shut down because it was a centralized service, right? Yeah. But then you had BitTorrent pop up, which is this decentralized technology that's simply ungovernable, like it's sim- simply uncensorable. You can't stop it, right? And so. Uh, now your your grandma probably torrents right like uh, everybody uses torrents everybody downloads music illegally it's become so pervasive and and now it's it's accepted that it just can't be stopped that the state just has to you know they're they're not really issuing uh court cases on anybody anymore because you know you you just can't stop it and i think the same thing is going to happen across every aspect of our lives right i mean you have bitcoin coming across now where you know it's, it's dramatically uh, revolutionizing, decentralizing, and democratizing finance, and you know they can try to suppress it, they can try to regulate it, and uh, you know they can try to exert the power of the state over Bitcoin, but it's this decentralized technology that you can't hold down, and that's gonna completely, completely overshadow one of the biggest. Um, one of the biggest pressures on humanity as a whole, and that's centralized banking. So Bitcoin is going to you know, step over that. Then you're going to have 3D printers, which come along and um, democratize and decentralize the means of production as far as capitalism goes. And then you're going to have, uh, you know, the sustainable energy is just the uh, decentralization of energy grids. And you're going to have people that start to use aquaponic systems in their own house to grow their own food. That's the decentralization of our food production. And you're going to have the decentralization of everything and the proliferation of these technologies that can't be controlled that are just going to make the state obsolete. It's not going to be a fight against the state. It's going to be technology making the state obsolete. And it's just going to gradually fade away. 
and it probably slipped back into its own niches, right? Like, you know, there's, there's this, that whole thing, uh, you know, as far as like the Christianity um, counter argument against atheism, right? Like if, if evolution is true, why do we still have monkeys? You know, like if we evolve <laughs> from monkeys, why do monkeys still exist? Well, because, you know, monkeys still have their own evolutionary niche. Mm-hmm. You know, there's still a niche where monkeys fit in and where they make the most sense in that environment. And I think government will slip back into that. You know, even though we're going to evolve beyond government and our society is going to be based on decentralized technologies and voluntarism, the government still might exist in these little pockets. And it's just going to be this old relic that only makes sense in these handful of areas and these handful of situations. And I, I think that's the fate of it. And that's what's going to come to be within the next uh, 50 years. Yeah, I, th- I agree. I think technology will, you know, um, emancipate humanity, <clears throat> and and I can just see the uh, the luddites or the you know the anti-technology yeah. folk, you know, you know, saying how you know technology, like let's say three D printers, you know, how can you print things that you know <laughs> we make, you know, that's destroying jobs. You're destroying my livelihood, <laughs> you know. But they don't realize yeah. how you know how much of an advancement how you know technology has really. Um, allowed humanity to flourish, you know, to, you know, over 7 billion people. Whereas before, you know, we, we were just, you know, struggling at, let's say, barely a billion or even less. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, you know, an easy way to I talk to these people who are anti-technology, you know, like, so so if, if we take your idea that technology is evil to the conclusion, right, then we should, you know, banish all trains, we should take everything on our backs, right? Because full employment, that's the, that's the goal, is full employment, right? Right, <laughs> so, right. So you carry everything on your back, you know, stop using excavators, you know, just, just use teaspoons to dig up the earth, right? You know, right. Every, everybody will be employed, <laughs> right? Exactly, where do you because, cut it off? Well, where do you cut it off? That, yeah. that, people don't realize the point that they decide to cut it off and say, everything, all new technology is bad because it's ruining jobs and this and this. Everything that came before is good, like, <laughs> the cutoff point that you decide to use is completely arbitrary. Like most people feel like everything that came out before their time is good, but everything new that came out <laughs> after their time is bad. <laughs> it, it's ludicrous. They don't realize people were saying the same thing about, you know, refrigerators and the milkman, right? Like, oh, if you can just if you can just keep your milk cold, what about the milkman? We're not gonna <laughs> if we just send emails, what about the mail? What about the postman, you know? Oh yeah. Oh, even even if we even if we value full employment over technological progress, right? Okay, yeah, you know the mailman might have uh, is starting to fade away a little bit, right? We don't need mail as much, but at the same time, there are a lot of email startups coming up and like now uh, you know there's more web hosting companies that have to manage email and it's created this entire new ecosystem of things for people to do, you know. But yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's if we even value the, the total employment over human progress thing. I think human progress is the most important thing and that we need to lift humanity as high as we can, as fast as we can. We need to uplift the billions of people that are starving and don't have access to resources. All, all that needs to be solved before we worry about like, you know, Oh well, what are we gonna do with our time if you know we have access to all the resources we need and we have all this technological <laughs> progress that makes human effort obsolete? Yeah. <laughs> you know? I know, I know, I know. It's uh, it's completely illogical, and then and then the hypocrisy of these people, you know, talking, you know, um, you know, talking about about technology while they're typing on their laptops and talking through Skype, right? <laughs> or or the or the anarcho communists who you know who uh, want to abolish private property, but you know they. They, you know, everything that they bought is is, is bought through capitalism, right? <laughs> through capitalism, <All> right? <laughs> I, I, yeah, right. Right. I, I, I really want to like reach through the internet and just lightly bitch slap everybody <laughs> I see on YouTube making videos that, that are talking down on technology. Like you're making a YouTube video and you're spreading it through your Twitter and your Facebook about how technology is evil and is disconnecting humanity. Yeah. <laughs> the hypocrisy is, really? uh, is painful sometimes. <laughs> really? You can chew on the irony. <laughs> <laughs> so, so why don't you... Um, um, let people know where they can find you and your work. 
Um, yeah, for my music and, you know, my writings and everything that has to do with L. Dixon, you can find it at l-dixon.com. Um, for everything, never get busted. And if you, especially if you have any loved ones or you know anyone that's, you know, suffering through any sort of drug case or is in, un, in prison unrightfully for, you know, a nonviolent drug offense, please contact us at nevergetbusted.com. And uh, if you need any web design, you can contact us at autonomitecreative.com. So that's my plug. <laughs> and uh, thank you, thank you, Danilo, and thank you, the Voluntarist, uh, Voluntary Virtues Network, for bringing me on. And I appreciate everything. I appreciate what you're doing, and I look forward to contacting and working with you guys in the future. Yeah, I, uh, no problem. Um, actually, your your, your term of um and what would you say? Nonviolent uh, drug offense is it, to me. It's kind of redundant. Like, what what is a violent drug offense? Like, is there such a thing as a violent drug offense? You know, <laughs> like yeah, if, yeah, if somebody, yeah, if, yeah, somebody yeah, if somebody is using drugs, it's like <laughs> that's their choice, right? How can that be violent? It doesn't doesn't really make sense to you, but <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Unless you're like smoking crack and, and slapping it's someone at the same time. Or, <laughs> yeah, right. I don't know if that happens, but <laughs> maybe I can see that. <laughs> but, but then again, yeah. what, you know, then again, in that case, you would put the crack in jail, and the person would be right if it's really against if it's really the war on drugs. <laughs> you put the crack and the marijuana in jail, and the person goes free, right? Because it's the war on drugs. <laughs> yeah, good point. Good point. Touche, man. Touche. <laughs> All right, cool. Yeah, so, man. so, um, why don't you leave the listeners with uh, any last message you want you want to give them before we sign off? I don't really have any last message. I feel like we've uh, tapped it all. All I'm going to say is uh, keep the peace rolling. Live free. Be free. Awesome. Simple. Simple and sweet. Very nice. All right. All right very mm-hmm. good. Thank you very much for the conversation. Um, L. Dixon. So this is um, Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and the Conscious Resistance um, YouTube channel. Uh, wish everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. <laughs>